The times are out of joint, or seem so, and the dog days are nearly here. The brute instinct of the white man has recently given full reign in the populous cities of Washington, D.C. and Chicago, Illinois, the home of Lincoln, and the political paradise of the Negro in recent years. What is the cause of these fierce clashes between the two races? They are racial and economic. The white laboring man in the North sees in the Negro a formidable rival in the labor market and regards his presence in North, Northern industrial and manufacturing centers as a menace to the white industrial classes in these sections. The race riots, which recently took place in Liverpool, England, were due to the same cause. The Negroes, who were good enough Morgans to work in the munitions plants of Great Britain while she was fighting with her back to the wall against the bitter and relentless foe are no longer deserved among the laboring element of Great Britain, and especially in such large numbers, because the places which they occupy in the labor room are needed by white English labor men. What is or seems to be true of the conditions in England will apply with equal force in labor conditions in the United States. The Negroes who have swallowed the bait thrown out by the Federation of Labor at its recent session at the Atlantic City will in time discover its unpalatableness when they attempt to digest it. The white labor unions do not propose or intend to give the black laboring man, organized or unorganized, a white man's chance to earn his brain by the sweat of his brow at white man's wages. White human nature cannot be changed by threats, legislation, or by resolutions. Neither can black human nature be changed by these methods. Race antipathy is inherent in men of all races, and it only can be eradicated and softened by education and mutual understandings of the viewpoint of each race. This requires time, tact, and intelligence, mutual forbearance and patience. These are religious, social, neighborhood, sectional, and national prejudice, and they are always will be. Just as there will always be race prejudice, the remedy for destroying race prejudice insofar as it can be destroyed, to me seems simple. Prejudice in the last analysis is after all ignorance. Prejudging people we do not know is unfair and unjust. We know people who are morally clean whose integrity is unquestionable, whose character is irreproachable, whose reputation is unsullied, and who are intelligent and capable. We are bond, bound, if we are disposed to be honest, to respect them. Now these are the qualities that command the considerations of just and honorable men in dealing with their fellow men, and that help to remove, not infrequently, to entirely, to eradicate race prejudice. It is manners, not dress, nor money, nor position that will make the man. And the manners married to brains break down more race prejudice than all the mass meetings held and fiery speeches made by perfervid orators and irresponsible and misguided agitators who now until The force that wins is intellectual. The sous avatar in moto fruiter in rue. The uncouth Negro in a silk hat and frock coat is not any better and does not count for any more among self respecting and refined people than any uncouth white man similarly arrayed. A fine coat offers, often covers great ignorance but never conceals it. The remedy, then, I should say, for removing or destroying race prejudice is to be found not in legislative enactments or in resolutions protesting against its existence and application, but in a change of the Negro viewpoint of those against whom their opposition is now directed because they are prejudiced against us. To find the cause of this prejudice and to re remedy it is to find the solution for the of the race problem in America and 
we will then have discovered, as will also many white people who now indulge unreasonable prejudice against the Negroes, Jews, Irish, Germans, Italians, etc., that the people we do not know when we really come to know them are as good as the people we really know. Of black sages and philosophers, the great Foley years ago paid this tribute. How are we astonished when we reflect that to the race of Negroes at present our slaves and the object of our extreme contempt, we owe our arts and science and even the very use of speech.